Perfect. So, you know, again, I think the goal here is to discuss what is clearly a uh, controversial topic, but hopefully I would clarify as we go through, not necessarily controversial, I think we want to let the data do the speaking, and uh, as Steve and I are good colleagues and friends, um, we'll present our debates as vigorously as we can, but we trust that uh, you at the end of the day will decide what fits your practice best. I think what you're going to hear as we go through here is that a brutinib is an effective therapy, and I think uh, during this afternoon, and you've heard uh, from data from uh, multiple trials, that shows that a brutinib is a very effective treatment. So my goal is to convince more of you that bendamustine plus rituximab, so I need to just clarify that this is bendamustine plus rituximab, is a better and optimal choice for patients uh, with uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So I think when you're trying to decide what is the optimal choice, because that's clearly our question, the first thing you have to ask yourself is how effective is bendamustine plus rituximab in Waldenstrom's? So again, making sure you understand, we're talking about Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So if it's effective, as I hope to show you, number two is how durable is the benefit that you see with bendamustine plus rituximab? Clearly, if it's effective and it's durable, does it come at a lot of a price? Is it, is it going to have a lot of toxicity? And I hope to show you that you don't need to give a lot of treatment and you don't have a lot of toxicity to get a substantial benefit. The, th the fourth point that's really important is, did you limit your options? So in other words, by picking bendamustine plus rituximab early in the disease course, did you in any way compromise what you could do down the road? And I hope to show you that no, you did not. And then when all is said and done, and you know that you have an effective therapy that is durable, that is not particularly toxic, and that hasn't compromised what you're gonna do next, question is how does that stack up? against a brutinib. So that's what I hope to discuss with you as we run through things. So the first question when you have two effective therapies that you have to ask yourself is, how do you like to take off a Band-Aid? So again, just think about that. Are you one of those people where you really like to avoid pain and you pull it super slowly and you kind of feel pain for a very long and extended period of time? Or are you one of those people who goes, I got to have this all fast and you're more of a rip kind of person, and you pull it faster, the pain might be a little higher, but it's gone sooner. So the key question as we weigh this up is well, how does that stack up bendamustine plus rituximab versus abrutinib? So shown here are the guidelines from MSMART. This is what Mayo Clinic does, and we kind of put our heads together and really just say, what is really the most effective therapies that we as a group wish to uh, support and encourage people to think about. So I think what's really important to start off with is just to explain that we're talking about this group of patients here. So we're not talking about treating people that are asymptomatic, and you just heard from Dr. Halleck that in CLL that population still be, is observed, same is true in Waldenstrom's. We're talking about people that have bulky disease, multiple lymph nodes, that have got pancytopenia, that have anemia, thrombocytopenia, constitutional symptoms, potentially hyperviscosity, people who clearly need to get treatment. If you're talking about that group, this is the group that I hope to show you that bendamustine plus rituximab, probably only for four cycles, is sufficient therapy, no maintenance treatment needed thereafter. A little akin to the quick pull on the Band-Aid. So, as we run through, this is what I hope you'll hear. Firstly, that it's highly effective therapy. It's effective in relapsed patients, and I'll show you data to support that. It's effective in first line. And again, we have to acknowledge that numbers are small, so we need to be cautious, but still I think there are a substantial body of evidence that I'll show you that will support its efficacy. I think the second thing to remember is that for a short course of treatment, you're going to get a very durable remission. So again, I think I hope to remind you of that data and show you trials that support that. Also, many people will say things like, well, it makes your blood counts go low and it takes a while for them to come back, but I'd like to remind you and show you data to support the fact that you don't need to give full six cycles of treatment. Most patients can benefit just with four cycles and have a very durable remission. Furthermore, there's all kinds of discussions about the fact that toxicities are the problem 
and I'll show you that toxicities are modest, and I'll show you that MDS and malignancies are uncommon, or virtually unheard of, and you do not compromise transplantation. So where do I get all this information from? Well, I'm fortunate to be able to start this off with Dr. Trion's data. So here is a trial, bendamustine plus rituximab. This is in relapsed and refractory Waldenstrom's patients, treated at the usual 90 milligram dose, but again, what I want to highlight for you in multiply treated patients, very high overall response rate. There was short follow-up at this point, but the duration of response looked very promising. Here is a subsequent study that substantiated that. So this is again in relapsed and refractory patients, this time a bigger study of 71 patients. Again, a high response rate as you see, with a follow-up that was getting closer to two years, progression-free survival not reached at that point. The point I want to make with this study that I think is really important to remember is that not everybody even needed 90 milligrams per meter squared. A third of the patients as shown here actually had less than that, anywhere between 50 and 70, and their response rates were pretty similar. So you do not necessarily even need in patients that are very pancytopenic to give the full dose of treatment and still get a very durable benefit. If we move now to the front line, so this is the original STILL trial from the uh, East German group that uh, originally had 274 patients with various low-grade lymphomas, but we'll focus in on the small, I stress small, subgroup of people who got it in front line. But if you look at those patients, the overall response rate was 95%, but I think more impressive than that is that the progression-free survival median exceeds five years and is in fact approaching six years. So again, with a modest treatment, very durable remissions. So you might argue, well, fine, that was that one trial and it was just a few patients, but here's some data from our group, looking again at real world setting. I just want you to look at the blue curve because this is not a comparative trial, but this is just regular DRC for comparison. But whether we looked at it in front line, 95 or 93%, or in the second line, 95%, two-year progression-free survival at 88 and 66% respectively. So very durable benefit, often for very little therapy. This, I think, was also interesting and just reminds you that you may not need a full six cycles of treatment. Now, I have to caution you, this is in marginal zone lymphoma, which is not exactly the same disease, but many of you will know that the pathologists have a lot of trouble telling them different under the microscope. But this study gave four cycles at the usual dose, but in fact, after three, they were assessed. If they had a complete response, they received only four cycles. If they didn't have a complete response, they received six cycles. Here's what really is encouraging. 100% of the patients had responded, and 75% of them were in complete remission, requiring only four cycles of treatment. And here is even more astounding number, the seven-year progression-free survival in this cohort is 93%. So again, very modest treatment, very short duration, may not even need full doses, and the durability is quite phenomenal. So you go, okay, well maybe there's too much toxicity, maybe this is not such a good thing. But again, I'll remind you that you just heard from Dr. Brown that abrutinib has some toxicities. If your eye comes over here to the BR and the grade threes and fours, because that's what we care about most, you can see that although leukopenia and neutropenia are seen, this is pretty modest. You have to remember they didn't even receive nulasta in this particular trial. If you were to say, well, okay, what about the non-malignant, the non-hematological side effects, you can see that those are very modest. A little bit here of skin rashes, but many in the group, many in the room, treat often with bendamustine and rituximab, and we'll know that that's not a substantial challenge. So I'd remind you, toxicities seen here are only four to six months, then they resolve, and patients can really be on no treatment, because remember, I'm not saying we need to give them maintenance, no treatment for an extended period of time, obviously then with no toxicity. So you might answer, well, okay, but maybe I've messed up my options hereafter because maybe I've complicated what I can do next. And I'm actually going to put to you that that's not true at all. The first thing you hear all the time is, well, you can't collect stem cells. Well, there are multiple trials that would not support that, but the, probably the most convincing one is in mantle cell lymphoma. This was the SWOG study, head-to-head -head comparison of bendamustine rituximab 
versus hyper-CVAD. The interesting thing, the study was stopped because you couldn't collect stem cells, but in the hyper-CVAD arm, not in the bendamustine rituximab arm. Hence, that's not the problem. Well, do you compromise responses? Brutinib has been used very commonly now after bendamustine plus rituximab, and response rates are really high. So you haven't compromised that in any way. Did you make patients more likely to transform to a more aggressive study, a more aggressive uh, disease? Here again, multiple studies being done, never shown an increased transformation. Well, you've induced uh, M MDS for sure, right? No, there are now multiple studies, read one reference right here, that shows no increase in myelodysplastic syndrome. And in fact, Dr. Trion's study itself reports that as one of their conclusions. Now, I would just caution you that as you think about all of this in contrast with the brutinib, remember that particularly in mantle cell lymphoma and CLL, when you relapse after a brutinib, none of this may be true. Many times the relapses are more aggressive, they're more rapid, they're often transformed, and the survival is often poor. So the question is, does continuous therapy actually select a bad clone? And I think there's evidence to suggest it does. And that's why you relapse, and that's actually a very unfavorable circumstance. So what do I hope I've convinced you of? First question is, how effective is bendamustine plus rituximab in Waldenstrom's? And the answer is, highly effective. You might argue, well, a brutinib is too, and that would be true. But how durable is the benefit? Well, you can give only four cycles of bendamustine plus rituximab and get yourself a greater than five-year progression-free survival. Well, you could possibly get there, and I stress the word possibly because we don't actually have that data, but you're going to need to give a brutinib every single day for all five years to get there, whereas you could have been done four and a half years ago with just bendamustine plus rituximab. Well, how toxic is that? Well, modest, well-tolerated, many in the room know. You can give only four to six cycles and be done. Or you can keep with a low level of toxicity on a brutinib for year in and year out. Or otherwise, you could be on no therapy, hence no toxicity. Well, have you limited your abilities to actually go ahead and do further things thereafter when you give bendamustine plus rituximab? And the answer is definitely no, but you might compromise yourself if you use a brutinib and something grows out, which is a much more aggressive clone. So when you have multiple therapies that all are very effective in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, to answer the question, what is the most and best optimal approach as initial therapy? I think you have to be guided by two principles. First one is, what's the maximum benefit you can get for the least toxicity? And secondly, what's the shortest duration of treatment you can give and get the most durable remission? So if that's what you're going for, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. You give four cycles of bendamustine plus rituximab, and you get a response rate that's greater than 90% based on the data I showed you, and the median progression-free survival that's over five years, and you get it for not a lot of toxicity and no therapy for four and a half of them. So with that, I'll thank you for your time.